Having risen through the ranks from a boy seaman cadet to a naval warrant officer seaman specialist. Rear Admiral Griffiths was born in country New South Wales up in the wine country uh, around Colburn in the Hunter Valley. And I'm going to let him let you all know that he turned 97 last Sunday. Don't worry, I'll get a wallop over the left ear hole later on. <laughs> he entered the RAM College as the lowest of all low as a cadet midshipman in January 1937 at the age of 13. He likewise made his mark on the Navy. After graduation from the RANC, Minnie Griffiths joined the RN battlecruiser HMS Repulse in March 1941, and that is 79 years ago this month. He sailed from Sambawang Naval Base in Singapore on the 8th of December 41 in company with battleship HMS Prince of Wales looking for the Japanese Imperial Navy. They found them off Kwantan on the north coast of Malaya and were sunk on the morning of the 10th of December, 1941. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend uh, too much time explaining because I'm sure the Admiral will fill us in on his being shipwrecked and sunk off Kwantan. But he then became commissioning crew of HMS brackets, HMAS Shropshire, when the uh, Royal Navy loaned us uh, Shropshire as a replacement ship. He fought in the Battle of Leyte Gulf and Surigao Straits. He was promoted Lieutenant in 44. He received the DSC in May 45 for gallant, gallantry, skill and devotion of duty on the Shropshire. He did gunnery course in the UK, RN and HMS Excellent. In 1950-52 he was gunnery officer on HMAS Sydney, aircraft carrier of the RAN, and saw service in Korea in 1851. In 1952, he was promoted to Lieutenant Commander, Midia, and Gunnery Officer of HMAS Anzac, D-59. Her motto, United We Stand, and saw his second service in Korea. 1954, he attended staff course. In 1955-56, he served on HMAS Melbourne as an officer. In 1956, he was promoted commander, and late that year as staff officer, operations and intelligence for the um, fleet officer commanding the Australian fleet. In 1958, he was director of manpower in Naval Officer Camp Naval Office Canberra. In 1961, he commissioned. Uh, uh, and became CO of HMAS Parramatta III, DE-46, River Class Frigate. Her motto, Strike Deep, and had a crew of 250 men. He became Director of Weapons Tactics and Weapons Policy in Naval Office in Canberra after commanding Parramatta. In 1964, he was promoted Captain. On the 18th of December 1965, he was appointed CO of our new HMAS Hobart, the second D-39, with a crew increase of 333. Three, three. Magic, ba ba ba. <laughs> and he was on the Vietnam gun line. He commissioned this Charles F. Adam class destroyer in 1967. He served on the gun line. He was awarded DSO, again for devotion of duty in the face of the enemy. In late 67, he was advisor to the chief of the Royal Malaysian Navy, we all know as Tana. In 1970, he attended the Imperial Defence College, London. In 1971, he was appointed Director of Ops Plans in Naval Office, Canberra, and promoted Commodore. In 1973 75, he became CEO of HMAS Melbourne, our flag, um, R21, with a crew increase of 1,350 men including the Fleet Air Arm Contingent. In 1974, he was Navy Help Darwin. In 1976, he was promoted Rear Admiral and appointed Chief of Naval Personnel. 1979, Flag Officer Naval Support Command, also made an Officer of the Order of Australia. In 1980, he retired after some 43 years in the service of our country. 
I give you Rear Admiral Guy Griffiths, AO, DSO, DSC, RA, and retire. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Once again, my humble apologies for being so late. If you've got to be late, make it so. Um, just thinking the other day, if I'd, I was looking at my notes, if I'd been late at Naval College in my first entry, I would have been given six across the backside. <laughs> uh, some of you have heard me say that every speaker needs at least three things. He needs gray hair to look wise. He needs glasses to look scholarly and he needs hemorrhoids to look concerned. <laughs> <laughs> but my worry this afternoon is A, I'm late, B, uh, that uh, A, I don't have the problem. Um, secondly, um, I, I was late, or am. And thirdly, Dennis has just taken half my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, just talk about a few events here and there, will you? We'll, we'll see where we get to. Um, <clears throat> college in those days, starting in 37, was a bit, uh, bit raw. It was based on Dartmouth in England, and I think if we looked at it today, we would be quite critical of what happened in those days uh, and the initiation into discipline, because as a country kid, it was, uh, wasn't total shock, but it was some, uh, some shock. Anyway, one survived. It was Friday, 13 December, uh, 1940. Um, so uh, I don't have any problem with Friday the 13th. Some people may. We were posted, the first five in alphabetical order uh, in my term were posted to HMAS Australia, which is of course over operating in the North Atlantic on uh, convoy duty, patrols, etc., etc. So we uh, were pushed into, uh, uh, got to over to Littleton in New Zealand from just after Christmas. Uh, Thought of the motor vessel Karamea of the Shore Saddle Line packed with goodies in Suffolk, UK. So the uh, Pacific horizon was only broken by a distant view of uh, the tops of some Galapagos Islands before we got to uh, uh, Panama Canal. And um, I must say, Panama, Panama was very exciting because one had read about it, but to watch it in operation was really quite something. Anyway, in the Caribbean, up the east coast of uh, the States, and of course, summer changed to winter rather rapidly. Uh, we sheltered in duffel coats. Any who had the privilege of wearing a duffel coat knows how useless it is against any form of weather below that 25. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we made our way across the North Atlantic. Uh, some mighty ocean movement here and there and gales, blizzards, etc. All part of the initiation we're going to see, I suppose. Uh, a couple of days out of Glasgow, nothing had been seen saw a couple of aircraft on the horizon and we moving around and we thought, what a good idea, we've got some uh, anti-submarine patrols. Well, they weren't quite. They uh, turned into the ship and the captain pressed the alarm buzzers and uh, needless to say, there were a couple of Heinkels experimenting with bomb dropping. They dropped the two low, fortunately. The bomb bounced up, creased uh, Derek uh, in the horizontal position just far into the bridge over the side to port and burst in the ocean. So other than that and a few bullet holes around the place, there were no casualties and no other damage to Karamea and we steamed on to Glasgow, got there, surrounded by snow-clad hills and all the rest of it, which to me it was new. I hadn't experienced that before. So we went down to London and it was there that we discovered that Australia at that time was probably halfway between Cape Town and Fremantle. And so we had missed that one. And they took a couple of weeks to um, sort us out. We arrived in February. And on the 8th of March, they found hammock slots for five mids. By the way, you all remember the old uh, classification of a midshipman? 
I think it goes back to the old sale days, but uh, it probably still applies, is the lowest form of animal life at sea. <laughs> um, anyway, we joined Repulse and immediately went off on convoy duty. And throughout that period, from say March through to about August, that's what we did, except we were distracted at one stage to be, uh, to join the home fleet under Admiral Toby in King George V battleship carrier Victorious, which was so new that it was still unpacking its aircraft out of uh, uh, cases. And uh, we went off to look for the Bismarck. Well, a couple of mornings later, uh, breakfast conversation, which had been quite eager in anticipation of uh, engaging Bismarck, was rather quieter because Hood had been sunk. And uh, we thought, well, she's not heavily armored and neither are we. So anyway, um, we went on a bit. Little did we know at that stage that Prince of Wales had actually damaged the uh, Bismarck and deprived it of a lot of oil fuel from the foreign tanks. And the ship, instead of patrolling and <coughs> searching around the Atlantic, had to head for Brest. So um, we uh, went off to Halifax, and uh, that was good fun and bright lights. Back to UK, more convoys, and we got further south past uh, Jude, Freetown, uh, to Cape Town, took one right around the corner, which was uh, an army boost for the prior to El Alamein and all that uh, series. So uh, we uh, made uh, Killandini Harbour at Mombasa our headquarters a couple of weeks or so, and then went to Ado Atoll, which was not terribly attractive, and uh, then up to Colombo, where the dockies refused to work on us for some reason or other, but uh, midshipmen weren't queued into politics at that time. And uh, then we went round to Trincomalee, and when we got there, we learned that Prince of Wales was joining us, and both ships were going to Singapore uh, to act. I don't think the word was used uh, in our conversation, but as you know from historical records, uh, Winston Churchill wanted a deterrent against the Japanese to discourage them from coming south. Well, it didn't quite work. And um, so we eventually got to Singapore about 2 December, a couple of days in harbour, and then of course on the 8th of December the Japanese bombed Singapore, and uh, quite well, we fired our anti-aircraft armament, and um, I don't think we hit anything. And uh, later on the 8th, of course that was Pearl Harbor Day as well, and later on the 8th in the evening, uh, the Admiral took us to sea, as Force said, where Prince of Wales repulsed four destroyers, Electra Express, Vampire, and Tenedos. A Tenedos was a little old lady and uh, didn't have long legs, so she was detached for the last uh, series of incidents. So where we went, um, <coughs> we had been sighted by Ricky Aircraft, and uh, during the approach on the 9th northward, we went right around and up the coast, off the coast, uh, to try and disrupt a landing in the area of Singora. Well, by 8 o'clock in the evening of the 9th, the Admiral decided the surprise had gone, time to go home. Well, that was okay, but on the, um, in the middle of the night, uh, somebody had reported that there was a landing at uh, Quantum. So we diverted, went in to have a look, arrived just after dawn, Admiral sent in a destroyer express, which reported that all was quiet as a wet Sunday afternoon, so there was no battle there. And um, so we hovered almost around in that area, about 35, 40 miles east of Quantum. Out of 11 o'clock when we were heading to Singapore, the first aircraft raids began. First was on Repulse, the bombing attack. They hit us on the uh, aircraft deck, uh, penetrated down to the Marines' mess deck, killed a few people and wounded others. Um, Prince of Wales had an initial torpedo attack, which um, 
first we put her out of action because uh, it, uh, the torpedo attack hit port side out, bent the port out shaft, and uh, of course high revolutions that tore the guts out of the ship on the port side aft. It lo locked the rudder as well, so it was not under command. Two black balls hoisted, and that was virtually the beginning of the end of the POW. Um, it was on the morning of the 10th of December when the Japanese uh, sent off their aircraft from air fields near Saigon. They were all twin engine, uh, they had a thousand mile radius, and at some stage, and I'm sure some of you have read, or most of you have read, the Admiral was told it looks as though they're doing a torpedo attack, and he said there are no torpedoes around. That is the one, or one of the problems of the war. How the hell did Britain not know about the Japanese uh, placing of some 85 lethal aircraft uh, so far south uh, to disrupt things? But if Admiral Phillips didn't know about it, nobody had told him. And if somebody knew about it, um, I'm sure that it's in a locked or destroyed file. Because uh, I, I, I just don't believe that nobody knew. Anyway, uh, attacks continued after 11 o'clock, torpedo attacks. And our captain, William Tennant, great fellow, um, he managed to dodge about 19, it was estimated. So that shows that they're fairly thick in the water, so to speak. And eventually, uh, they started to register at 11.22. We got a, doesn't matter where we got, we then subsequently had one hit on the starboard side and four on the port. And at 11.33, 11 minutes later, the dear old lady uh, had listened to port, rolled over and went down stone first. Uh, we lost some 500 and nearly 520 fellows out of 1300. Uh, it wasn't long to get up on deck, although it was ordered. And uh, then, of course, the ship sinking takes a few with it. So uh, that's what happened, and there we were in the water. A lot of kind people have asked me because I worried about sharks. And I actually <laughs> said, uh, quietly, that was the last thing in my mind <laughs> at that particular time. So um, Prince of Wales went down about 45 minutes after we did. So the three destroyers, Electric Express and uh, Vampire, picked up the survivors, headed back to Singapore where we got about midnight, a bit of a clean up, some kit, and uh, a bit of a sleep. And on the morning of the 11th, uh, Captain Tennant, who survived, um, he ordered all the midshipmen to go to the cruiser Exeter, which was in port, due to sail on the night of the 11th. And uh, I think, I don't know what his exact words were, but something like, uh, get the midshipmen out of here, they're not going to contribute to Singapore. And uh, how right he was. But it basically saved our lives for a start. So, uh, Colombo, uh, couple of weeks, I think, uh, relaxation with the wonderful hospitality of the people, some of the people there, marvelous. Then we were sent across to uh, Trincomalee to join <coughs> HMS Revenge, that uh, elderly battleship of uh, not very modern ability, capability, and uh, she was the guard ship of Trinco. Well, uh, well, quite a bunch of midshipmen went over, and clearly the gun room was a bit too small. And anyway, uh, it was almost heartbreaking, but it was certainly frustrating. There she was, seven weeks we stayed in Trinco without moving, seven weeks. And uh, perhaps the only piece of uh, training that I had there, well, one of Parts of I used to run the water and motor boat, take them in short of an island for relaxation. And the wind always forces onto the jetty. You couldn't do anything about it. Difficult to get off. Well, I had one of those uh, usual cheery 
are in very offices with me, the courts, and, and uh, he saw me being worried about this when we'd sort of things out. He said, you've got to remember, sir, that old rule. He said, when in a corner and no room to turn, drop it, F it, have a burn. <laughs> <laughs> of course, everybody smoked in those days. I didn't. So, <coughs> we did leave after the seven weeks and uh, went out in form up with the Eastern Fleet, which at that time consisted of, uh, oh, by the way, Revenge, I think was built about 15, uh, eight 15 inch guns, not much AA. Top speed about 23, uh, lumbering around the ocean. And uh, she had three sisters, Ramillies and Resolution. And so we formed up on uh, War Spike, which was the flagship uh, in the Eastern Fleet. And uh, we operated uh, sort of mid ocean. Um, I'm not sure we really looked for trouble. There was a carrier or two around. But the Japanese came through the Malacca Strait and uh, with aircraft carrier and some cruisers and sank the Dorsetshire in Cornwall. And then they sank the Hermes and the Vampire. And of course, as you know, those Hermes and Vampire fellows ended up in camp. So, uh, <clears throat> at the end of our time in revenge, which I've always described as being the most unattractive uh, time in my whole service, those few months from uh, in early 42 to mid 42. We then did our midshipman's exam, sent back to UK for, uh, oh, what a little incident. Uh, the, we had a very RN-ish type character as Southern Gunnery. He had one of those charming hyphenated names, which I think he felt uh, raised him above everybody, <laughs> but we felt uh, that it didn't raise him anywhere. And uh, because of the crowding of the gun room, he decided that he was going to petition off. He had a couple of spaces for armchairs, and um, he was going to petition that off, and nobody was going to get in. Of course, a petition reduced the area for the rest of us. <coughs> well, I had a chap in my term, Morris Maloney. Uh, Maloney uh, by name, and Maloney is an Irishman. And Morris, having had a couple of beers one evening, I think, plus others, he wasn't alone, we decided we would get rid of this petition, which we did rather rapidly. <laughs> and um, nothing was said. Uh, the, the, there was no sort of discipline from the sub-lieutenant. It was just accepted. Because if he'd put up another one, it would have gone the same way. <laughs> uh, he really was not a friendly fellow, it's a pity. Total contrast to the Southern Repulse gun room. In the old days, the junior officers' mess was um, uh, really a continuation of college in its rules and regulations. But uh, Richard Poole, our sub lieutenant in Repulse, said, Well, actually, the midshipmen are here with sub lieutenants, so I want to run this as a junior wardroom, which he did. It was all a very happy affair. It was really great. So um, we get to uh, England for uh, what they call subs courses. And this is now 42, end of 42. And um, we built it around Gunnery School, uh, Torpedo School, and so on. And also went down to Brighton, where we built it in Rodine College. Uh, they had actually removed all the contacts from the buses at the head of the bed, which under a little sign, if you need a mistress during the night, press the buzzer. <laughs> well, of course, needless to say, there were young hopefuls here and there, but <laughs> didn't bring any results. <laughs> so, uh, by the end of uh, the year, we had uh, completed uh, our such courses, and um, were then received a uh, posting to, uh, let me think, um, Sydney, uh, Shropshire, Shropshire. 
and uh, we had time to fill in before joining, which was due in April of 43. And um, I decided I needed a wash keeping ticket, so I went to an old BMW destroyer operating out of the site, escorting coastal convoys up and down the east coast. They were a vital part of UK logistic plan. And, uh, but it was fun because of the average speed, of course, about eight knots. Uh, it was also winter time, in December, January, February, it always seems to be winter time. And um, so it was new and um, if all the old fellows had their instructions to peel off the convoy, which was about seven miles long and a couple of lines, and lots of uh, puffers here and there, and then they would go in and turn off into the uh, port. And um, one fella peeled off to, to go into the hull. And um, the ship, a friend of mine was in, uh, also trying to get a watchkeeping ticket. He uh, went up to the ship and said, you're not allowed to go in there, you've got to go north and you're going into somewhere up top. And the uh, reply from the bridge of the puffer said, I'm going up the umber. And he went up the umber, <laughs> just exactly as he wanted to. It was Poppy's home port anyway. So we did that, joined uh, Shropshire, uh, basically at the time for um, uh, passage back home. But uh, she, of course, had to be uh, commissioned as HMAS. We kept the name, but uh, she had to be commissioned, so that was nice. And then we um, went up to Scarpa. Nobody wants to go, but you have to go to Scarpa Flow occasionally. And uh, we did our training and exercises up there. The king came aboard, inspected the ship's company, and wished us well. And we needed every good wish we could get. So then we, in August 43, all by the time all this happened, we were heading home, escorting the convoy. Um, down as far as Jib. West of Jib, we detached, went on south, Cape Town, Durban, Fremantle, Sydney. And it was nice to be home because we had, the mids in my group had all been away three years. So it was a bit of a stretch, but you get used to it. Now, um, of course, Shropshire, her story is probably fairly well known. We joined up with uh, uh, Australia, uh, Warramunga, Runter, and three American destroyers in November 43, up in Milne Bay. And then we were part of MacArthur's bombardment force for all his landings along the, uh, the New Guinea coast, uh, leading up <coughs> eventually to the Philippines. And um, it was quite, it was, in a way, later we were joined with three American six-inch cruisers, all modern, air-conditioned. Uh, they all slept in bunks. And it, uh, the food that you went over, which uh, we eventually did from the gun room, went over to have dinner there. And I uh, was sitting next to my host, and <coughs> named, uh, he was an ensign, Fred Hip. Uh, kept on knowing him after the war and so on. And, uh, Fred said uh, to the steward, so what's on for dinner tonight, steward? And the uh, steward said, chicken, sir. God damn chicken again. <laughs> well, of course, we would have given uh, <laughs> yeah. lots of dosh compared with the bully beef which we would uh, eat. Uh. So um, <clears throat> we went on, and um, at that time, the strategy was for two, a two-pronged attack across the Pacific. Uh, one led by Admiral Nimitz, based in Pearl, Pearl Harbor, with his third and fifth fleet. Uh, you've heard the name Admiral Halsey, no doubt, quite a lot. And uh, a dynamic character that didn't always do what he should have done. And um, then General MacArthur to the south, who, having sworn to the Philippines, I will return, uh, proceeded to do so. He picked out various spots for landing so that they could put down uh, good airstrips to uh, 
not <coughs> from which to operate the long-range aircraft, and uh, so away we went. And uh, that was that took us 43, and then in uh, October. <laughs> Yeah, about the end of towards the, in October <coughs> '44, we got he got his whole force up to Lady Gulf, and you we have read books, I imagine, on the Battle of Lady Gulf. Well, it involves the landing on the 20th of October. It uh, involves the Battle of Surigao Strait, which was a night surface battle against the Japanese force, which was destroyed. The Battle of Samar, which was east of where we were in the Gulf, was a bunch of escort carriers, <coughs> a lot of guts in that outfit, and a, a bunch of destroyers acting as their escorts. Now, <coughs> after the night at Surigao, where we sank ships and spent a fair amount of ammunition, on top of what we've already expended supporting the troops and <coughs> I think they put ashore some. 40 or 50,000 troops <coughs> in, uh, on Lady Island. So MacArthur had returned. And um, so um, these destroyers in charge of you know, escorting the carriers immediately peeled off against the Japanese force, which came through the middle of the eastern side of the Philippines through San Bernardino Strait, led by one of their 50,000 ton battleships. And, um, proceeded to move southward. But the destroyers, I think with enormous guts, courage and all the rest of it, professionalism engaged this task force for battleships and cruisers and destroyers. But for some reason or other, the animal turned around and went back through San Bernardino Strait. We, of course, after Surigao, were mustering, ready to go out to uh, counter this outfit. But it would have been a bit of a touch and go because our ammunition at that stage was down to sort of down 35%, something like that. We badly needed ammo. Anyway, they went home. Uh, Halsey, meanwhile, came into the scene and he uh, was supposed to actually be in a position to engage that middle force, but he was attracted to destroying their aircraft group to the northeast corner of Luzon. And, uh, so he, he did that, and he did it well, as usual, but he certainly wasn't there to hit that other Japanese task force. So eventually, um, we uh, went back to Leyte. Uh, we, actually, sorry, we, we spent um, six weeks in the Leyte, in the landing, and that's where we first experienced the uh, kamikaze. Well, one went hit the Australian on the bridge, which killed a captain, the navigator, Commander Raymond, and um, uh, a lot of you would know Mike, and um, that actually only, it introduced us to the kamikaze, and they tended to increase. And uh, at that time, our close range armament had in uh, Shropshire, was 20 mil early guns. And, um, so then after all that, we uh, uh, went back to, uh, to Manus Island, which was a big naval base. And there in, uh, where were we, about in November, I think, January, uh, end of the year, uh, that's when uh, our uh, brighter bunch of characters, the band, and the leading seaman, who was a compare, is known as Count Whitby, who was a leading hand, and uh, they put on uh, a show on the forecastle of uh, music and dancing. Uh, three, three of the midshipmen uh, ate the uh, Andrew sisters and so on. It was all good fun, and we invited people from other ships to come and have a look see. Now, <clears throat> in January uh, 45, we moved to the second major landing in the Philippines at Lingayen Gulf which is northwest of Manila. And uh, the plan was to put some 60, uh, 68,000 troops ashore 
so that they could move towards Manila and take it, which eventually they did. So anyway, the landing, uh, there were some 875 ships heading to Lingayan Gulf, and of course troop carriers, etc., went in and landed their boats. We, uh, uh, with the bombardment support force again, and stayed there. Australia, for some inexplicable reason, uh, was hit by five kamikazes. And the dear old lady looked a bit of a wreck. But with a lot of guts and a, a still working 8 inch fire control system, they stayed on station and <coughs> fulfilled all their bombardment support items. It was a terrific effort. And eventually an American admiral went across to say, Good day to Captain Jamie Armstrong. I said, well, how are you doing? And he had a look at the ship. He says, you've got to get out of here and go home for repairs, which they, they sent her home. But five, five <coughs> of these fellows hit her. Shropshire, <coughs> about a thousand yards away. We were attacked time and time again, but uh, no hits. How we managed it, I don't know. There was somebody looking after us. Uh, when we had gone back to Manus after uh, Leyte, our gunnery officer was a Warwick Brace girl, known as Braces throughout the service. And, uh, quite experienced in the Mediterranean, and uh, he came along and uh, he brought with him into Shropshire quite a lot of the experienced chaps that he'd known before. But when he got back to Lady, uh, to Manus after Lady Gulf of um, races, uh, decided that the 20 mil was no damn good and we needed 40 mil. How to get it? So he um, presumably got a hold of the workboat and put in two cases of whiskey, uh, went ashore to the armament headquarters or whatever it was, and he managed to extract 13 single barrel. <laughs> Uh, 40 mil bofers, and these were positioned all around the upper deck, and uh, were most effective, yeah. way ahead of the 20. So, <clears throat> and also in those days, he had ensured that when we had fitted out at Chatham, uh, that um, we had what was known as a barrage director, a little range finding set radar, and um, bearing and elevation type thing, bearings especially. And we used these barrage directors to direct the turrets, uh, then to fire HE uh, to burst at 3,000 yards. And uh, that was most effective. We even got radio news from Tokyo that we were, we were using flamethrowers. Um, well, the flame was the, the HE bursting, but it sort of effectively helped keep them away. We got a few fellows who hadn't got the message, and um, but it was it was good. So um, that landing was uh, <coughs> fulfilled. It was uh, completed. The, the U.S. had returned to the Philippines. And one other thing about Shropshire, we had a very good radar set from the U.K., and it was managed by a reporting officer. Uh, Ronnie Major, a reserve lieutenant, who had been into uh, checking it out way back in the UK days and confirming it down here. And you have a sort of an envelope where the height at which the, you can determine the height at which where the incoming force of fighters or attacking aircraft, where they penetrate that limit. And Ronnie could tell people roughly coming in at 15,000 or whatever, 10. And the fighters put vector onto these. And um, the ability of Shropshire was way above anything else that was in the field. And it was, it was favorably reported back to US headquarters. So uh, after that, we uh, in July uh, 45, we supported the Australians <coughs> going in at Balak Papan. Uh, nothing complicated about that, except for the fellows ashore. 
and they had the we completed more uh, fire support and um, then of course we got back to Sydney where we heard about the news of the bomb on the 6th of August, the 9th of August and the 15th of August we all breathed a sigh of relief and a big hurrah went up. War isn't a pleasant game and I sincerely hope that we never ever have another one like WW1 or WW2, which uh, spread itself across the globe. We threw a party in Shropshire on the quarter deck for about 400 guests, our own ship officers, uh, any RAN to make it, USN officers, and so on. <clears throat> but during the party, uh, somebody spotted a couple of young characters with engineering. Shoulder, lieutenant, shoulder boards on him. And they were all the they were getting around and having a great time. But nobody knew where they came from or actually who they were. We'd all been together for quite some time, so it didn't take long to establish that these were two very enterprising young stokers. <laughs> <laughs> from one of the engineering divisions, and uh, actually it was on the Philip Berry Smith, I think. And um, so, needless to say, they were up in front of the commander's table in a couple of days' time. Our commander was Copper Morrow, who uh, cut a wide swath through the Navy at the time, a great bloke. But uh, Copper was reasonably uh, unconventional, and uh, he, he said to these blokes, did you enjoy the party? Oh, yes, it was tremendous fun, really. <laughs> and Copper said, yeah, I'm very, well, I'm very happy that you enjoyed it. Because he, he said it <clears throat> cost the uh, cost the wardroom officers each 35 shillings to, you know, form a bank for the party. So he said, uh, fine, <coughs> 35 shillings <Yeah>. each. <laughs> <laughs> On caps, about 35 shillings. <laughs> <laughs> So we then went up to Tokyo for the surrender signing and the, the atmosphere, the, the might of naval power and air power was demonstrated to any Japanese who was outside their house. And uh, hundreds of aircraft flew over. Tokyo Bay was full of ships and uh, it was a memorable occasion. Uh, so, of course, instead of being funny, feeling relaxed. Now we've got a few months to do nothing. I got a posting in September to go and join the, uh, be available in the UK in January 46 to do the long specialist gunnery course of HMS Excellent. So I had to get down to Sydney about a month's leave and then by uh, the uh, uh, ship Stirling Castle, which was certainly different to taking passage in nature made a structure. <laughs> and, um, so I had a good good time on board and joined up. We went to Greenwich first, rubbed the cobwebs off the brain. Mine had a lot of cobwebs, I found, or found in those days. I was sitting in my cabin one night, and one of our brilliant fellows in, the, uh, in my term was David Hamer from Melbourne. Absolutely brilliant, but he was one of those chaps that remembered every word of a conversation or every piece of formula. And I sat in my cabin one night, trudging my way through uh, some sets of formula. And David said, Guy, come down and have a beer. And I said, oh, I'm working on it. He said, what's the problem? I said, you know, all these uh, formula we have to know. Oh, he said, there's no problem. He said, you don't need to know them all, you only need to know 20. He said, these are the ones, and he wrote them all down. <laughs> Just like that, he said, they didn't come and have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, after that, we went down to uh, the gunnery school at Pompey, and um, that was reasonably uneventful. Uh, Admiral Leach, the late Admiral Leach, was there when I was on the gunnery school later, as you I will have heard that um, he was present when the, one of the sub lieutenant's courses brought an elephant into the morning Friday parade. And of course, everybody shouted, get rid of that elephant. But it was 
easier said than done. <laughs> but uh, it introduced a little humor. Into me. So, finished the law course in uh, March 47, went down to the gunnery school in Devonport in the West Country. And at that time, I hadn't realized that uh, the Griffiths family actually had uh, originated for some time in, in uh, Bedford in Devon, which I visited much later. Uh, but anyway, the West Country was its usual charming self, um, and um, it was great. Stayed there for three years until um, I was ordered to join. Uh, let me see, what was I joining? Oh, I uh, yeah, joined the uh, Sydney, which had commissioned and was just heading home, so I was taking passage. Back to Australia, gunnery school. Having just spent two years in the gunnery school, I protested. So, um, okay, they dug me out of the gunnery school. In January 50, I joined the carrier as a gunnery officer. That, of course, is um, a rare occasion for gunnery officers because there's 40 mil bofors were there, plus a couple of pom poms here and there. Mm -hmm. But um, talking of pom poms, one of the uh, uh, professionals uh, named uh, Leading Seaman Kazali in Shropshire, I'm going back, jumping back to, uh, uh, let me see, Lady Gulf, uh, Lingayan Gulf, and the um, council was up uh, maintaining his mountain. And suddenly he spotted one of these fellows diving at us, on the back and Linga, diving at us. He swung his mounting around, pressed the trigger, and split the aircraft apart. Needless to say, he did get a medal for that. Terrific work. He, he was a great bloke anyway. So, um, Cerberus Gunnery School, um, aircraft carrier. Um, all I could do there really in an aircraft carrier was not, it wasn't so much parade and uh, there was certainly not much gunnery, but I did marvel and got to know about living in an aircraft carrier and its operation. And I shared a cabin with uh, Jock Cunningham, uh, who was a uh, pilot in the uh, uh, Sea Fury uh, pilot, I think. and. Uh, I just had to admire the, the professionalism of all members of the carrier air group. They really were terrific. These fellows flying at night, um, and uh, I'm sorry, yeah, they, and their uh, sheer guts. And of course, we went up to uh, Korea, and they did a lot of patrols, um, east coast, west coast to Korea. Once again, winter time, duffer coats, uh, no use. And uh, at one stage, we were in uh, Sasebo, or yeah, Sasebo, and a typhoon was approaching. And Captain Harris, David Harris, uh, took the ship to sea. He wasn't going to try and ride it out in harbour because he wasn't sure that anybody really tested the typhoon boys for good, secure holding in, 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 in harbour. Anyway, we went out, it was rough as hell at night. We lost a few aircraft because securing lines gave way. And um, anyway, when we got back, Sasebo Harbour was a mess. And I, I learned from that one. And um, needless to say, of course, we got back home. We actually were 64 days on station. Uh, at that time, 64 days, we flew 2,366 sorties and uh, we had three pilots killed and 10 aircraft lost. So, <coughs> penalties for having been at sea, I went back to the gunnery school. I protested again and I sent off to uh, be the uh, gunnery officer Anzac a new battle class destroyer. This is, of course, in uh, end 52. And I joined off the west coast of Korea. Uh, November, I don't think the ice flows, pancake ice flows, had started 
but it was damn cold. I took a command with Robinson, and uh, once again, it was duffel coat time, wasn't it? <laughs> so, needless to say, uh, we got uh, into the army store in Curie, the first opportunity, and got a variety of stuff which actually did tend to keep out the cold. <laughs> so, um, other than the winter, we, we did our job. Uh, I didn't like the fire control system uh, and said so. It was okay for surface firing, but not much good for aircraft. So we got down, uh, went back to uh, Anzac, saw that out back in mid-July in 53, Sydney, uh, and then I was sent off to staff course in early 54, and that was at Greenwich, and then I joined Melbourne, which had been renamed from Majestic as she was from the building. We did a renaming ceremony, and um, I joined Melbourne as a gunnery officer. And of course, she had a slight angle deck, flying sea venoms and gannets, and uh, once again, tremendous professionalism from the carrier air group. We took a lot of, uh, lot of cargo aircraft on our way home, and uh, little did I know at the time, and nobody was broadcasting it on board, there were lots of uh, very telling conversations going on in Canberra about uh, the viability of maintaining a carrier in the RAN. And of course, lots of us know where the pressure came from, and uh, it was budget excuse, and uh, of course budgets can uh, have quite an effect on your war readiness. Um, then in uh, 57, we went up for CA to exercise and so on, and uh, it was in that visit in 57 that I met a, a wonderful lady, and uh, we got married in 59, and Carl always accused me of taking two years to make up my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, I was back in Canberra in personnel, and my first, pointed to my first command, HMAS Parramatta, the first of the rivers. That was fantastic. Overjoyed with that one. And I uh, was posted from June uh, 65 to uh, January 63. Uh, <clears throat> we went to Seattle, exercises, and called around on the east. Uh, the capabilities of those ships were quite good. It had a, a different, uh, we had a change of fire control system. My uh, gunnery expert in tactics and staff requirement, John Smith, had been uh, looking at a Dutch system I think it was either a Mark, Mark 22 system or something. And uh, he said, have a look at it. So we had a look at it and everything was good. And we acquired one for Parramatta and one for Yarra. <coughs> and uh, subsequently, other ships. Uh, it, was, it was good. And it was simple. And it wasn't, uh, wasn't like the previous one I uh, experienced. So occasionally you have to branch out and uh, things which appear good in the old RNRAN family uh, have to be changed. Needless to say, uh, time marches on. I then went back, of course, after Parramatta, back to Navy office. Uh, in January, what was that, 63, I think. And a couple of years later, the Admiral, uh, Chief of Navy, <coughs> called me into his office, Admiral Harrington, who's always known for his uh, sense of humor. And he said, uh, <laughs> well, he, he did have one. And uh, called me into the office and he said, uh, ah, Griffiths. Yes, I, I'm, I'm thinking of sending you to New Delhi as the uh, naval liaison officer. What do you think of that? 
Well, I said, well, I don't think much of that, so. <laughs> <laughs> he said, hmm. He said, I thought that would be your reaction. He said, well, you better go over to uh, the US and pick up uh, Hobart, <laughs> the commissioners at the end of the year. And he hastened to tell me that I couldn't take the family because I wouldn't be away longer than 12 months. Well, needless to say, one was away longer than 12 months. Nobody apologized to me or nobody apologized to Carla for giving an extra couple of months, but that was, of course, not only Carla's lot, but every naval mm -hmm. wife had to put up with that. Uh, so we, we go through Hobart. Anybody want a break? You're fine. About that, another five or ten, and that's it. Um, yeah. Before I got there, or certainly when I arrived, I realized that the highly technical uh, fellows have all been over to the U.S. for pre-commissioning courses, <coughs> and invariably most of them have passed out top of their American courts in conjunction with United States uh, fellows on training as well. And so that indicated that there was a, I was, it was being established as it was a good ship's company. And uh, it wasn't long uh, before we uh, fortunately left Bay City, Michigan, down to Boston, Massachusetts for commissioning 18 December 65, and then on down to Norfolk for some trials. But meanwhile, I'd arranged, having been with the Americans in, uh, well, both WW2 and Korea, um, I wanted to see what their fleet training group equivalent did, how they handled getting their ships from you know, the raw state out of a dockyard sojourn or out of commissioning into operational readiness. And so I went over to San Diego and talked to the, uh, the boss. I said, I don't want any niceties for the Aussies, I just want you to put us through exactly what you put an American ship through. And if you've got any add-ons, don't hesitate. So he did that. And um, I think he found difficulty because I had first met Ira Bonnet as a warrant officer from the cruise of Nashville in Milne Bay in the end of 43. So we'd known each other for quite some time. And here I am in uh, 65, 66. Anyway, um, as commander of the fleet training group, I told him initially, don't be nice about it, give us the real result. And so he did that, and at the end of it he said, uh, we, uh, we are quite glad that you're on our side. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good. So needless to say, at that stage of the game, I could easily form the opinion that I had an outstanding ship's company. Every member from the juniors to through to the seniors were first class. It really is quite something. Um, so then it was home from San Diego, Pearl Harbor, Fiji, first water call Hobart in 1 September 66. Then at the end of 66, we were in the dockyard, we were in Cockatoo. We didn't really need docking. And, um, the RN came out with a carrier and some destroyers and brought a couple of their Hampshire's class with them, which we had looked at when we were about to decide whether to buy the, the guided missile destroyer Adams class from the US or the Hampshire class from the RN. It went the US way. And uh, just watching the ships operating, they managed to <coughs> break down a few times, which was a bit of an you know, However, uh, at one stage we were heading south, and I'm posting, you know, uh, we were heading south, 21 knots, I was stationed on the port quarter of the carrier, victorious, and they, for some inexplicable reason, no reason at all, but he changed my station to the starboard bow. So I thought to myself, well, he expects me to go under the carrier's stern and claw my way up the starboard side. 
So we had four boilers connected, and that gives me 30 knots at the drop of a hat. So I wound them on and then requested approval to cross the bows, which was granted. So I creamed across, feeling pretty good actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the other 330 fellows on board felt the same way. <coughs> anyway, I subsequently met their admiral at a party in um, Sydney when we got back from this exercise. <laughs> And uh, in chattering amongst various things he was talking about, and he said, came out with the expression, I can't imagine why you chaps bought this American rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at him and I thought, you shut your mouth, Griffiths. <laughs> <laughs> I actually turned away and went and talked to other people. It didn't seem to be any uh, uh, need to say anything. <laughs> So on top of that, we have Hobart in Vietnam. Uh, we did lots of work. And once again, the outstanding ship's company were dominant. Um, they really were amazing. We did lots of work. Uh, I had 20 officers and 313 sailors on board and um, two five-inch rapid-fire guns. And we had to exchange barrel after about 2,000 rounds. Uh, and so we worked our way through it, off the coast, doing interdiction, assisting troops, um, harassment and interdiction, and I have been very careful about the accuracy, getting on targets and so on. We received quite a few uh, responses from their shore batteries. We got some shrapnel on board, uh, but uh, never a hit. So we sailed through the six months in Vietnam <coughs> without any casualties and without any damage at all. And um, we ended the operations from March 67 to September 12. We went back to Subic, turned over to Perth, and um, went home, or came home. Uh, it was all, Vietnam was plus, and professional fun. Not always basic laughter, but a feeling of professional satisfaction uh, because of the reliance I can play on, place on every one of the ship's company. <coughs> Quite unique. And I've used that expression outstanding often, and I will continue to do so. So, having well gone, gone well over time, Oh, it's only six o'clock. Um, <laughs> uh, if you'd like to take a few minutes and do nothing, or I'm happy to field some questions if you feel you have some. That's the end of my address. I don't think I have anything. Statistics, and oh, I'll give you some statistics. The mathematicians will enjoy that. Um, in the six months ops, in uh, Vietnam, we steamed 52,000 miles. We uh, engaged 1,050 targets. We fired 9,240 rounds. We received fire on 10 occasions. And we did 117 replenishments at sea day and night. Uh, everything came by replenishment. It was well done and excellent. Um, so um, that's about it. That's enough semi-war stories for the day. Oh, thank you, Admiral. Uh, just some time for questions. Uh, so we'll just hand over to the floor. I want to ask you, uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, you're in your era. <coughs> nuclear submarines in your era in the 60s to today. What's your opinion on well, I must say that the, uh, in our maritime world, the distances and the need to stay on station for a long time, I think we ought to be moving towards nuclear power submarines. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, logically, <coughs> Australia has to go into the nuclear business sometimes. You can read it. There's a lot of chatter going on about it at the moment. And uh, I don't think it's... <coughs> 
I don't think it's sensible to stay uh, without nuclear power in the country, heavy engineering. That will take us a while to get on, uh, up on the step. Mm. Mm. Yes. Admiral, you mentioned I've heard two, after 2,000 rounds of main gunfire, the Hobart had to change barrels. Yeah. That correct? So we had 9,000 rounds, so you had four barrel changes during Vietnam. Uh, yeah, we might have. Uh, we certainly changed them once. Sorry, I do a shoelace of drift. Um, we changed them after 2000. Uh, no, I don't think we did change them the second time because they would have gone before and uh, we would have kept them on board and changed them at home. Excuse me a minute. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Well, I'm a bit young for the Navy, but so I might not know everything, but in the war, as a midshipman, were you? What, what was your day-to-day uh, -day job there on the ship? As a midshipman? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. part of it, we were keeping watches, <coughs> but we were, I was a lookout on the starboard wing of the bridge, and we had other fellows with binoculars <laughs> looking out, okay? Uh, because you're always worried about somebody creeping up. And uh, I had to start the wing of the bridge. Uh, I could always remember the morning watch. Uh, actually, it was the middle. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, we were supposed to meet up with the Bismarck. And I can tell you, my eyes were <laughs> very keenly looking through binoculars without, fortunately, without seeing the Bismarck. <laughs> Years later, uh, through German friends. Carl was, uh, was a German of Bavarian. And uh, through other friends, I managed to get a book, Battleship Bismarck, which tells the story from the scene of the surviving officers of the Bismarck as to how they operated and what happened to them all in that action, finally. It's very interesting, I must say. He had the, uh, the short name of Burkhard von Mullenheim Reschberg. But uh, he wrote an interesting story. Very good. Oh, and, and the other thing, we were in training classes as well. We had, had instructor officers and the other executive officers in the ship were updating us and training us during our time. Strictly a training, training period. Yeah. I understand that uh, when the Prince of Wales and the Repulse were sent out to Singapore, they actually were supposed to have been accompanied by... Sorry? When the Repulse and uh, Prince of Wales... If she'd been in company with us, she would have gone to the bottom as well. Ooh. I mean, that's a hell of a force of bombers at that stage, four twin engines, thousand mile radius, and 31 of them, I think, were torpedo bombers, 54 ordinary bombs. Uh, that's quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And they were all concentrated on us. Nobody was watching cricket somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> they were all concentrated on four step. Mm -hmm. They left the destroyers alone, mm -hmm. which meant that uh, we were picked up. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it would have been uh, quite some way into quantum. Well, if you have no other questions, can I just, uh, on your behalf, could I thank you, Admiral, for sharing with us your very, very brief overview of your extensive <laughs> military history and experience, and uh, we hope that one day you put it on, on paper. Yeah. We're all, that. We're all been saturated with it today because of <laughs> yes, Dennis's sir. introduction. <laughs> <laughs> We need four out, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of this. I know you don't like it, so I'll help you with it. <laughs> What's wrong? It's hard rations. I said, I know you won't like that bottle. I'll help you with it. <laughs> well, you want me to pick something? No, four. We need four individual ones. Four. Yeah. One. You want to open that up? If your name, if your name is called, first one is uh, Delta 61. 
Just come and select the book you would like. Excuse me, sir, I must go. <laughs> Thank you for the kind reference. Yeah, about 61. Oh, I'll never forget. Build a 61. Green. 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 All the same colour. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Gordon White. That's fine. Yeah, he likes it. Phillips, man. I know it was by the railway set. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Next one is Delta 64. Thank you, Pete. Oh, I Delta 49. Delta 49. Delta 49. Delta 49. Delta 49. Delta 49. I tell you what. Oh, <laughs> and the last one is Delta 67. <laughs> 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 Get the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, very much for attending today. Um, it's a very special day having such a senior officer with such a military history. And I do thank uh, you know you all for attending, uh, not only our olds and volds, but also uh, our visitors from the various sub branches and maintenance associations. You know. Um, Whilst he's not listening, the, uh, uh, it's a living legend. It, it, this will be on podcast. Um, it'll go on our YouTube. Uh, please look in the next week or so, and uh, Seamus will have it up and posted. Um, I even got a special request from Canberra, from um, the Chief's office, to make sure that it was uh, taken down. I've only known him to do it twice. Uh, before uh, one was in uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, last uh, yes. August when he was now, our lead guest on. speaker at the yeah, Malara okay. War. Uh, and um, before that, uh, uh, we time. had another uh, taking yeah, in Singapore yeah, back in uh, 2005 yeah. when out of the blue one day, mm -hmm. I get a signal oh, from the DA at the uh, British High Commission I saying you, um, um, you have been be recommended as a uh, yeah, anchor in Australia uh, as a Navy guy and story. And um, do you know anyone that served on the repulse of Prince of Wales? <laughs> and I shot back a signal to the, the captain who was an engineering captain. I said, so happens to be that at one stage, a boss of mine happened to be a MIDI on the repulse. And it was uh, when we went up to Singapore for the establishment, and only took the Brit 60 years, uh, to actually uh, <coughs> to produce a memorial in Sembawang to 4Z, and who, would, who should be the senior officer surviving, uh, along with the most junior sailor on board, who I think even then was in his late, uh, late 80s, um, they unveiled the memorial. It's a pity that uh, Sembawang is now run by the Yanks, uh, but you can actually get access to there through the Ranlo in Singapore. Uh, if you're ever in Singapore and you want to have a look at that memorial. Each time I go through there, um, I find time to go and pay my respects and lay some flowers on the memorial. So once again, thank you very, very much for attending today. And I think we learned a lot about uh, the old man. Thank you. Sir. <laughs>